Friends, would you join in a word of ecumenical solidarity with a lot of other Christians who pray this prayer? Be in prayer with me if you would. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Tis the season. Every two weeks at the beginning of December, our world has taken part in a ritual. It's a party of sorts. It's called the Conference of Parties, the United Nations Climate Change Conference of Parties, to be precise, COP28. It's happening right now in Dubai up until the 12th of this year. And I have to say, it is looking at the activists' memes and images coming out of Dubai, not so much a party this year, as our leaders around the world are struggling with one of the most basic concepts of climate justice, the phasing out of fossil fuels. The most recent rhetoric that we are hoping gets into the language for this agreement is fast and fair fossil fuel phase out. It's nice alliteration there. It's a little hard maybe on a Sunday morning to repeat those words, but friends, that is the hope. Phase out. Cease now, perhaps, even. Could we imagine a ceasing of the use of things that are harming God's creation so fully? But I want us to begin today not thinking about a a, a difficult party, but uh, something more pleasant. I want you to conjure your favorite mug. I've asked you to do this before, but find that favorite mug from your cupboard and grab it and fill that mug with some hot cocoa, some Christmas cookies, your favorite novel, perhaps your favorite Christmas movie, and curl yourself up and take it in. Receive the comfort. For that is where we began our service today, and I want us to remember that as we delve into Advent, that we begin with comfort. Comfort you, my people, says your God. Hear and feel that comfort this day. We heard it from our opening opening hymn, those words from Isaiah, in our call to worship. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Your warfare now is over. Is that a pipe dream? Our scriptures keep repeating it, it seems, throughout our holy texts. But since October 7th in Israel, Palestine, our world has known nothing but more war having spread from Ukraine and Yemen now to these holy lands, within our own families, within this country. So hard to know what to say, where to be, as the terror spills not only from tanks, but from voices. Now 17,700 dead in Gaza after 1,100 murdered in Israel. The vast majority of those who have died, of course we know, are children. In this season, as we lift up the hope in pregnancy, the hope in children, the hope in the next generation having the light of God in them, seeing such pain is nothing but terror as we hear our headlines day after day. And so our texts from comfort in Isaiah seem to fall flat And we're given also that first reading from our gospel today from Mark, the words of Jesus bringing out apocalypse. In those days after that suffering, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. We're feeling that right now. We're grateful in a small way for this refrain that comes at the beginning of every Advent season, this interruption from the words of Jesus into our world, naming the hard stuff in our world. And we cannot 
forget in this that this war, these apocalyptic times are not just far away. They are within our own tradition. We are complicit in the things that are unsettling in our world right now. As Christian Zionism continues to be lifted up, there are Christians who are praying for there to be war in the Middle East so that Jesus would come back. Many of us do not hold to that theology, and that is still part of our Christian story. We need to wrestle with that. We need to wrestle with the tough things in our tradition, and I hope push back against some of these as we reclaim the story of a brown Palestinian Jewish rabbi named Jesus who came into this world and calls us to confront the powers that divide and distract us from the ways of God. For many, Christmas seems to be getting canceled in Gaza this year. And yet, again and again, we see the call to peace, the call to hope, the call to light candles in the midst of a world that wants to snuff them out. Often I feel as if words fall short. Therefore, today I'm grateful that we have had Taze chants bookending our gathering as we lean into these scriptures, the contemplative, prayerful approach, the songs that come even when we don't know the words and the right things to say. I'm grateful for this past week and our midweek evening prayers gathering on Zoom as we listened to a video of Ukrainians singing Christmas carols in a subway as air raid sirens went off. That image of resistance and hopeful conjuring in the midst of an uncertain world is something a name for us today in our service here. For today, of course, is the fourth day of Hanukkah in the year 5784 of the 27th of Kislev in our Hebrew calendar. It is also the year 1445 in the month of Jumada, the 26th day in the Islamic calendar, the 2023 in the Gregorian calendar, December 10th. Friends, we are defined by difference as people who walk this earth. And yet, again and again, our scriptures call us into the fray of that difference and lift up for us again and again stories of defiant hope and a longing for peace on earth. Thank you, Dan, for lifting up so well for us. Luke's reading in our second gospel reading today, a familiar story that we pick up from last week as Reverend Joshua lifted for us the story of the priest Zechariah who was struck mute in silence from angel Gabriel in connection to the lifting of that good news about a pregnancy. And today, so often as our scriptures do, if we pay attention, we move from a patriarchal to a feminist lens. And we hear and are introduced to the story of Elizabeth, the one who, though getting on in years, is favored and endowed with grace. Immediately in our story, we hear of Elizabeth finding that she is pregnant in her advanced age and seeks seclusion. Now, I wonder why. Perhaps this was a healthy seclusion. We all know that. At times, we need to seek solitude and silence when things happen that seem out of the ordinary, when we're hit with unimaginable pain or unimaginable hope, we sometimes need to find that seclusion. And that is a sacred type of seclusion that I would call solitude. But I wonder too here if Elizabeth is drawn into a seclusion which is more of an isolation out of the fears of being excluded for what is happening to her aged body, the fears of judgment, the, the fears of a pregnancy not lasting, the fears of not having enough strength or stamina to, to live into this new calling, perhaps a fear of not being understood. I wonder if Mary also had those same fears albeit in a very different way. Mary, not a privileged person, perhaps like Elizabeth, being part of a priestly family, pregnant out of wedlock, 
marginalized social status, but I would imagine, too, not being understood. I have heard this refrain again and again since October 7th, that the world and so many people feel not understood. Through our GBIO networks, many of us were summoned to a gathering by our Jewish colleagues who put on a webinar with 1,100 or so of us attending to listen to the voices of Jews right now, many Jews right now, who are feeling isolated and misunderstood and abandoned by their Christian and their Muslim colleagues because of the rhetoric of division, because of isolation, because people don't know what to say, they have not said enough, and our Jewish colleagues have invited us to show up. So too we've heard from Palestinian and Muslim friends that they too, in the light of so much Islamophobia, are also feeling misunderstood and maligned and threatened as three young college students are shot in seemingly peaceful Burlington, Vermont because of the crime of wearing a keffiyeh. Things are unstable, but over and over again, the refrain of not being understood seems to underlie so much of what's happening. So in returning to our text today, we, we, we listen in with the lens of the excellent womanist biblical scholar, Reverend Dr. Will Gaffney, who reminds us of Mary's name. It is Miriam, named after that great prophet who walked with Moses and helped set the people free. As Moses stood there and held the staff, it was Miriam who ushered the people to freedom through the reed and red sea into the promised land. It was Miriam who stood up and said, there is a different way. And so too, this Mary of Nazareth, the Miriam of Nazareth, is asked a very important question. Can you help set others free? Like Zechariah, Mary is visited by that angel Gabriel, but there are some important differences. The Greek word used to describe Zechariah's response to Gabriel that we heard of last week is troubled, but the Greek word used to describe Mary's response to this angel visitation is greatly disturbed. Mary is far more shocked by what is happening to her. But notice she is not struck mute in response, like Zechariah is because of his doubts of what God might do. Mary has an inherent trust, and yet she asks some important questions. How can this be? She asks Gabriel to go on, and so Gabriel does. And notice it's only when Gabriel says, there will be someone to walk with you that she says, let me go, here I am, the servant of the Lord, let it me be according to your word, that she goes. It's not enough when Gabriel says, you are beloved, you are favored, God is with you. That seems not enough for Mary. It's only when Gabriel says, there is a human one to go with you, that I am sending ahead of you to prepare the way of pregnancy, of disruption. Her name is Elizabeth. When Mary hears that, you see the troubledness descend and, and dissolve, and she goes on her way. And she makes haste, right? She goes to Elizabeth to be with her. The tradition is that Elizabeth and Zechariah live in En Karim, in the Judean hill country, some 80 miles from Nazareth. Can you imagine a newly pregnant, scared, unwed teenager going by herself with haste? those 80 miles through wild land, she must have been driven by a desire for solidarity. And look what happens when Mary shows up with Elizabeth. She not only finds comfort as she is together, leaning into this new experience, but so too Elizabeth finds liberation. She comes out of her isolation because Mary comes to her. I love the image written by Reverend Lauren Wright that we have seen before. It's on your screen. If you're worshiping online, you might be able to see it here. This icon written by Reverend Lauren Wright, which depicts Elizabeth and Mary coming together, their faces both joyful and frightened and troubled, together putting a hand on each other's fullness. There, too, lies hope in this radical 
solidarity. Mary seeking her kin, Elizabeth seeking liberation from her isolation. Blessed is the fruit of your womb. Blessed are you among women. It is Elizabeth who reminds that to Mary, not just the angels. It is the human voice. And I wonder if that's even more important for Mary to hear from Elizabeth saying, you are special. God has chosen you to bring about some peace in our troubled world, to bring something new into our world. And I wonder if it was Mary's youth and questions of Elizabeth that brought her out of her seclusion and reminded her that she had an incredible role to play in helping prepare the way, bringing John and John's radical voice and call to peace, not to Pax Romana of the empire, but a peace of liberation where all people are heard and baptized into that Jordan of, of newness, of cleansing, of new life. There was a ceasefire action a few weeks ago where a lot of clergy gathered of all traditions and tried to say, look, we don't have all the answers by any means of what's happening in the Middle East right now, but what we do know is all of our traditions say war is not the answer. This is not making Israelis safer. This is not bringing hostages home. We need to cease this and bring about a new way. And look, there was a ceasefire for a few days and hostages did come home. We pray for more of that. One of the things I was most struck by after this ceasefire action was that one of our Islamic friends, Brother Ahmad Bari, invited all of us over for a meal. He said, I don't know what we should be doing next, but what I do know in my Islamic tradition is that if we remove our shoes together and sit on the ground and eat, some truth might bubble up. So about a hundred of us came a week and a half ago over to Dorchester to the, the mosque there, the, the Mashad al Quran, and we were hosted by our friends. There were Jewish friends, there were Christian friends, friends of no faith, Muslim friends, all sitting together. And we ate together, we breathed together, we prayed together, we heard stories, we lamented together, and we made some plans together. We didn't solve all of the world's problems, but I believe a little bit of peace was born in those relationships. It reminded me of the power of relationality of Elizabeth and Mary coming together to seek solidarity in these days. Friends, we all have that invitation to, to remove our shoes, to get into new spaces. I have to admit, it was not comfortable. It was not convenient on a Sunday night going to Dorchester and going into a mosque and taking my shoes off, not knowing what words might come, and maybe a picture of me might be there, and maybe some of my Jewish friends might think something, maybe some of my Palestinian friends might think something, maybe some of my Christian friends. And yet, in that discomfort, there was solidarity. Friends, I'd invite us to think the rest of this Advent into some places where we might remove our shoes, find a little bit of discomfort, but mostly find the solidarity that God is calling us to, to build peace. Peace is always local, it's always organic, it's always up to you and me. Peace happens when we show up for one another in solidarity in hospital rooms. This church is incredibly good at doing that. Praying for our friends across this world and here at hand who are suffering, who need more hope, to showing up through the giving of Christmas bags, through our deacons, through showing up to singing and leading in chants here in our choir. This is radical and loving, peacemaking work, friends. Showing up online week after week from New York or Vermont or down the street, holding each other in prayer, envisioning a new way forward for one another, sending each other texts that you matter, I miss you, you are loved at this time. Perhaps even this year, thinking about Christmas in a slightly different light, listening to the patriarchs and the Orthodox tradition who are inviting us into a more dim and subdued celebration across the world in solidarity with all those who know war and loss, and yet still practicing hope and peace and joy and love. 
I'm grateful for Faithful America, this anti-Christian nationalist group that is continually calling Christians to, to speak out for solidarity. There are some trainings that are coming up that they're offering free ones through a group called Right to Be, and I'll, I'll send these out for those who are interested. One on countering Islamophobia on the 18th, one on countering anti-Semitism on the 19th. Attending these kind of things, showing up, can be a form of giving a Christmas gift when we show up and remind each other that ultimately we are all favored. When we do so, as Tim has already prayed and lifted the voice of if we want peace, we show up for justice, we remember Mary after this encounter as a part of this before and through it she sings the Magnificat. That table-turning, amazing refrain that God has shown with their arms, scattering the proud in their thoughts and in their hearts, bringing down the powerful from their thrones and lifting up the lowly, filling the hungry with good things. This is the refrain. This is the work of peace that we are all called into. So I'm grateful for another time to sing a chant. The next chant we will sing together as a church is the chant that Jesus gives to us, my peace I give you, my peace I leave you, trouble not your hearts. Friends, this is the refrain of comfort. This is the refrain that we all are given, and I pray that we would sing it as we are led, as our choir comes forward now to lead us, as we are led by Mary and Elizabeth to prepare the way for Jesus who is being born once again. Amen.